God bless you all and welcome to Grace Point where it is our desire for you to encounter God, serve the world, and grow in community. I'm Stephanie, the children's pastor here at the church. Whether you're joining us in person or online, we want to let you know that we are blessed to have you with us. At this time, I invite anyone who's still in the lobby to come into the sanctuary and find a seat. Service will begin shortly, but first, here's some information for you. As a church, we believe that the Bible is God's word and it is the authority for life and faith. To learn all the fundamentals of what we believe, you can scan the QR code to see our full statement of faith. I also wanna invite you to come out to attend our What's the Difference series every Tuesday night at our prayer meeting at 7 p.m. During this series, we've been exploring the differences between Christianity and other world religions. This week, our topic will be Hinduism. We hope to see many of you there. Are you new to Grace Point? Whether today is your first time joining us in person or online, or you've been here for a few weeks but haven't connected yet, text WELCOME to 845-210-9911. We also invite you to visit our Welcome Center in the lobby after service. We have a gift for you. If you don't have a church that you call home, then I wanna invite you to be a part of what God is doing right here at Grace Point. Parents, if you have children age pre-K through sixth grade, we hold a service for them in our G Kids Clubhouse. Our nursery is also open for childcare for kids three and under. To check in your children, come out to the G Kids desk in the lobby. Well, God bless you and let's join in in praising the Lord. Well, good morning church. Good morning, good morning. Lord, we thank you today. We thank you, God, that you woke us up today. Lord, and you got us here, Lord. And so, God, we worship you. We worship you. We love you. We lift you up. We glorify you, God. Be honored. Be praised. Hallelujah.
worship. Only you deserve our praise, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, we bless you, Lord. We bless you. Oh, he's worthy. He's worthy. Hallelujah. We stand and lift up our hands. For the joy of the Lord is our strength. We bow down and worship him now. How great. How awesome is he? Come on, help me sing, we stand.
There is none like you. No one else can touch my heart like you do. And I can search for all eternity long and find there is none like you. Can we sing that together? Of the 
the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire in darkest nights. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend I have lived in the goodness of God All my, All my life you have been faithful All my life All my life you have been so, so good Amen. Today is a, is a great day. Praise God. But anyhow, my name is Matthew. I'm one of the elders. And uh, Elder Joe here. He's, and it's, uh, we are so happy to be here. And we are here to announce something. 
We are here to announce Pastor Daniel's birthday. Yes. <laughs> he turned 48. Yes. I told your age, Pastor. <laughs> uh, so, Pastor Daniel Plank, can you come forward? And uh, even Pastor Floyd, can you please come? Gonna get there this way. You know, as we just sang this song, all my life you have been faithful. And not only pastor here who has experienced, knows the Lord as a father and a friend and more than every one of us know that. And he has been good. He's been good to every one of us. And uh, what can we say? Just say thank you and praise God and tell how good God is. That's all we can do, the goodness of God. And I praise God for his protection, Pastor. I praise God for all that God is using you, continue to use you for his uh, Elder Joe has bought something here. So, you want to sing? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. To you, happy birthday, dear. Happy birthday to you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, would you mind standing with us? We're going to pray for our pastor. Thank God that God has brought him here. Uh, he follows his father, and the family has been such a blessing to all of us, and we just thank God for that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you today that you are a God of a faithful, faithful, faithful. Lord, you walk before us. You come after us. You lead us in the ways that only you can do. And Lord, we thank you for leading Pastor Daniel, Lord, for equipping him, for bringing him here, for anointing him to bless us with the word of God. We pray, Lord God, for him, for his family, Lord God, that you would just enrich them. Lord, let this be a wonderful, wonderful year as they follow after you. Lord God, to serve you with all of their hearts. We thank you, Lord, for the love that emanates from him to each one of us as we come together week by week. Lord, you are an amazing God. We thank you for giving us a pastor that loves you with all of his heart and expresses that love to us. Lord, we bless him as he's blessed us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 God bless you. Another birthday over there. Benny, Benny, 90, 90 Benny DeVivo. Hi, hallelujah. 90 years old. God bless you. God is moving. You, you want to sing for him also? Yes, we can. Okay. Could you sing for Benny? Sure. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Thank you. Now you know his family now. Hallelujah. <laughs> well, we're going to come before you for the offering. Praise God. Ah. Praise God. Spirit of giving. Praise God. Uh, uh, just a quick reading from Psalm chapter 8, uh, verse 4, where uh, David is talking to God because he's looking around, looking at the sky, looking at the stars, looking at the firmament, looking at the fish, looking at himself. And he just says, what is man that thou art mindful of him? And the son of man that thou visited him? Or human beings, and, you know, what is it that you see in us uh, being how great and how wonderful you are? And uh, it just brought to me uh, a story about uh, my boss at work when the Cheesecake Factory was coming to the Palisades Mall. Everybody was getting all excited. Oh, 
never had anything there, I never tasted it, but they were all screaming and jumping up and down, the Cheesecake Factory. I said, okay, that's nice, never tasted it. So when it finally arrived, they were coming back, this is wonderful, this is delicious. And my boss said something I never forgot. She said, this cake is to die for. Oh, it's good. I said, I better taste this cake. So <laughs> I went over there and I, I went there and I tasted it and it was really good. It was actually delicious. But it wasn't to die for. You know, it's to die for. You ought to die for. Hallelujah. Yes. The God of heaven yes. gave up his deity and he came down and he suffered and he bled and he died for you. He loves you. He gave his life for you. This whole book is nothing but a love story. To die for a piece of cake. I'm talking about God died for you. Yes. We didn't think about that. Jesus. Yes. And after he suffered and he bled and he died. Hallelujah. He wasn't finished. He set the captives free. And they said he's at the right hand of the Father praying for you right now. He's an intercessory prayer for us right now. He didn't cross his legs and check off the box, it's done. No, he's not finished. And the indwelling spirit is in you. If you know him as Lord and the Savior, all right, he's helping us to make it here. Jesus. So when we go for the offering, we give the tithes, we want to think about what he's doing for you. And it's not just that. I said this is a love story. The Bible says that he sings over you. You heard the choir singing? He sings over you. The Bible says that he dances over you. The Bible says he's preparing a place for you. That's when somebody loves you. They know you're coming over. He's getting ready for you. Jesus. Hallelujah. He says one day you're going to reign with him, and one day you'll be like him. It doesn't get better than that. When it comes to offering so that other people can hear the good news of the gospel, oh, think about why you might be holding back. Think about trusting God in his word and what he's done for you, what he's doing for your family, and what he's about to do. And I pray that that will move you in your spirit to give for the best cause you possibly could. I'm going to have Elder Matthew pray for the offering. Jesus. Father, we praise you, Lord, for this morning. Lord, thy word says, for thou hast delivered my life from death, my eyes from tears, and my feet from falling. Truly, Lord, you have kept us in the land of the living. And what can we render for all that you have done for us? Oh, that we will, Lord, give praises and thank you for what you have done. Even, Lord, this offering that we give. Oh, God, I pray that you bless this offering. May it be used for the extension of thy kingdom. I pray that you meet the needs of your children, oh God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, you can give uh, three ways. Help me, Lord. Got to calm down. <laughs> you can give online at uh, gracepointnewyork.org uh, slash give. You can give on your, at the text. Type in the word Grace Point, uh, uh, GF at 77977. And, of course, you can give as the buckets are being passed around. You could uh, give or have drop boxes in the back. Thank you. God bless. Here's a quick look at some of the latest happenings we have going on here at Grace Point. To see a full list of events or to register, you can scan the QR code on the screen or the one located in your sermon note sheet at any time. Last December, we started a Bible study group for law enforcement professionals. As a church, it's been on our hearts to minister to these individuals and offer a common space where they can have community with one another and study the word together. This month, they will be meeting on April 18th at 9.30 a.m. here at the church. If you or anyone you know is active or retired law enforcement, then we'd love to have you guys join us. For more information, you can scan the QR code on the screen. For anyone who is age 50 and above, our Anchors Ministry is hosting their monthly game night, Saturday, April 20th from 6 to 8 p.m. Come and join us here at the church to have some fun. On Sunday, April 21st and April 28th, the Walter Hoving Home will be having a collection bin in the lobby. 
If you'd like to see a list of the items that they are looking for, or if you want to learn more about how this organization helps women rebuild their shattered lives, go ahead and scan the QR code on the screen. We also have a list of items available at the information desk in the lobby. And lastly, I'm so looking forward to this year's VBS. We are already hard at work to make this year an amazing time. I truly love VBS. I love watching each child excitedly praising God each night in worship. I love seeing how children grow in friendships with each other and grow in their relationship with the Lord. I rejoice over every child who makes the life-changing decision for Jesus to be their Lord and Savior. I also love working alongside the most amazing volunteers who happily give their time and energy to making this week such a joyful experience. VBS is such a great week where each night is dedicated to learning about God while having so much fun together. I want to encourage you to register your child for this year's VBS. Just scan the QR code up on the screen for all the details and the sign up link. Make sure you do it soon because spaces do fill up quick. Well, that's everything for now. Be blessed, church. Well, God is good, isn't he? He is wonderful. Uh, do you know that when you read God's word, you find something sometimes that you need to do? Anybody find that? Well, Jesus came to fulfill the word of God, and as we read the word of God, we find things for us to do as well. Let me give you a scripture, if I can open my Bible here. It says in Proverbs 25, 25, like cold water to a weary soul, so is good news from a distant land. How many want to be a fulfiller of that today? All three of you, okay. Uh, well, today's Mission Sunday, and... If you recognize our missionaries, and if you send them a card, a letter, if you give them an email, whatever you do, it's good news to them, and it's like a cold water to them. We have almost 30 missionaries that we support. Too many things for me to hold here today. But we have a whole list of our missionaries back on the welcome table, uh, I mean the, the information table. You can look at that, and uh, I want to encourage you to be some good news some of our missionaries. That sound okay? We want to encourage you to write to them, email them, encourage them in whatever way, and also we're going to take an offering today. That'll be a blessing to them as well. We support them every month, and let me just tell you that we go beyond what our offering is here and add to that to send to our missionaries. Isn't that amazing? We want to support them in every way. Hallelujah. They've been called to serve the Lord, and they've sacrificed themselves to go in many different places. Uh, there are uh, missionaries all over the world. In fact, uh, we have the, the uh, Francis family that right now is over in uh, Indonesia and uh, the area over there working for five weeks. They're normally out of uh, Orlando where they have schools down there. They meet with all kinds of people in, in there, and then they take trips throughout the year to many different places to encourage the missionaries. So we're going to pray for Rob and Francis uh, uh, today as they have gone out to bless them. And so we encourage you to give accordingly as God has touched your heart. And so be good news. Reach out to them. Let them know that you love them. Amen? All right, you seem a little dull today. I don't know why that is. Maybe you're still tired. I don't know. Anyway, we're going to invite the ushers to come again, and we're going to give as God has given to us to our missionaries. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for Rob and Linda. We pray, Lord God, your blessing upon them, especially as they've traveled over to Indonesia again and to that foreign country. We pray, Lord God, that you would use them in a mighty way. Lord God, we encourage them in the in the spirit that you've given to them. Thank you for calling them. Lord, all of the other missionaries as well, we just lay them before you and say, Lord, you know their needs, and we pray that you would reach out to them, that you would touch them, encourage them, each one of them. And Father, use us as we write, as we call, as we email, as we communicate with the missionaries you've given to us. Let it be like cold water to a dry and a thirsty throat. Lord God, we love you. Thank you for loving us and blessing us with the opportunity to, to support so many. And so we give as you've given to us. In Jesus' name we pray. 
Amen. God bless you as you give. Let us stand as we worship God one more time. Amen. We praise you, Jesus.
Hallelujah. He's deserving of all the praise and all the glory and all the honor. I want to take a moment before you're seated just to pray one more time before we get into the word. Thankful uh, this weekend we have, I think, close to 90 women that are away at a women's retreat. I think we have a photo there if we want to put that up. But I got word from my wife last night that the, the service in the evening started at 7 o'clock. It was like 11 o'clock. They were still going. Uh, just seeing a great move of the spirit amongst the, the women of the church. So I'm told they're coming back on fire. I said, come on, bring it. So we want to pray for our women as they return today. Um, but I also want to pray because I'm sure you saw in the news what's taking place yesterday. We live in a, a challenging time. And so scripture does call us to pray for the peace of Israel. But we want to pray this morning for peace, that, that God would intervene in the midst of what seems to be a, a very challenging, difficult situation. Amen. And so let's take a moment to pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you today. Lord God, I thank you for each of these women that are away right now at this retreat. Lord God, we thank you for the things that you're pouring into their lives. Lord God, we thank you, Lord God, for the fullness of your spirit. We thank you for, for healing that's taking place there, for, Lord God, for just the encouragement that's coming. Lord, we pray this morning as they meet that you would seal some things in their lives. Lord, we pray as they, they make their way back home, watch over them, keep them safe, Lord God. Surround the vehicles as they travel. Lord, we just thank you for a safe return. And Lord God, as we look at our world today, Lord, we recognize, Lord, in the midst of what we see as chaos, you're still sovereign and you're still seated on the throne. And so today we do pray for the nation of Israel, Lord God. We pray, Lord God, for your protection. Lord God, we pray that you would watch over, that you would keep, Lord God. We pray, Lord, that you would come and you would intervene in such a way that, that things would not escalate, Lord God, but that there would be, Lord, peace. Lord, we thank you that when we pray for peace, we're calling on the Prince of Peace. And so we pray, again, that you would intervene and that you'd have our way, Lord, your way, Lord God. We pray this morning as we look at your word, Lord, that you would teach us, Lord God, that we thank you again for just this tremendous opportunity you give us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. You may be, you may be seated. Praise God, praise God. It is good to be in the house of the Lord today. I'm going to move this just a little bit so I don't run into it. Um, thank you for uh, your birthday wishes this morning. My mom texted me early this morning and wished me a happy birthday, and then she said, well, you get to go preach. And I said, man, there's nothing I would rather do on my birthday than to, to be in the Word of God and to, to be with all of you. Um, thankful to share this birthday with Benny. I got a couple years to catch up on you, brother, but... God's faithful, and I hope at 90 that I look as good as you, brother. Um, if you have your Bibles today, I encourage you to pull them out. Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. Uh, grab your note sheet. We're going to take some notes today, write some things down. You know, last week we just made it through the first five verses of Genesis, and i got to be honest, I felt like I rushed through it. Well, especially first service, for sake of time, rushed through it. Um, but we're in week two of a series that we've simply entitled The Beginning, and over the next year or so, we're going to walk together through the book of Genesis. Now, Genesis is the first book of the Torah. It's a book written by Moses about uh, 3,500 years ago, and it is a book of origins. It tells us of the origin of many things, but the one thing it does not tell us is the origin of God. Genesis speaks nothing of God's creation. That is because he is the creator. He's not creation. He is not a created being. There's no moment of creation for God because he's always been. He is eternal. Now, admittedly, that's difficult, right, for us to wrap our minds around because we, we live in the constraints of, of time and, and space. But God is eternal, and therefore he is outside of time. As I we said last week, he is the uncaused cause of all causes. And so the book of Genesis does not argue for the existence of God. It simply assumes God's existence. And, and part of the reason for that is who it was written to. It was written by Moses to the people of God after they had come out of slavery in Egypt. They had seen the supernatural power of God at work. They, they knew that God existed. They did not even need an argument for the existence of God. What they needed was to understand God's plan from creation. They needed to understand the importance of the order and the structure which God created. Now, Genesis is going to give us the origin uh, of many things, uh, including the heavens and the earth, the plant life, animal life, the origin of man. This is what we get from Moses in the book of Genesis 
written some 3,500 years ago. 165 years ago, in 1859, a man by the name of Charles Darwin attempted to give us his theory regarding the origin of life on earth, apart from a creator, in his book entitled The Origin of Species. He proposed in his writing that all life on earth as we know it came about through natural selection, through a series of transmutations over billions and billions of years. Now, there are a number of glaring issues with the theory of evolution. I'm going to touch on some of those today. But what most people don't know is that Darwin's strongest opponents, when he wrote on origin of the species, it was not the clergymen, it was actually the fossil experts of the time. Darwin himself admitted that the state of the fossil record was, and I quote, the most obvious and gravest objection which can be argued against my theory. And because of the fossil evidence, he said this, all the eminent paleontologists, all our greatest geologists have unanimously, often vehemently maintained that species do not change. This is Charles Darwin saying this. Now, even if you were to believe in the claims of evolution, again, we'll talk more about how those claims have really been debunked in so many ways. But even if you believe those claims, there is a larger question which says, well, where did the planet Earth come from, right? Well, everybody knows that, Pastor. That comes from the Big Bang Theory, right? The Big Bang Theory is a physical theory that describes how the universe was created from an initial state of high density and temperature, and it says that the matter interacted in such a way that caused an explosion that created the universe. But the problem with the Big Bang Theory is, well, where did that matter come from in the first place? Understand, science has no answer for that question. But Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 does. The Bible boldly declares that all that is seen in the universe, all that exists, exists because of God. He is the source. He is the creator of all things. Now, to the skeptic in the room this morning that would say, well, pastor, I'm just really just supposed to take what the Bible says to be true, I would say yes, but I would also encourage you to slow down and to open your eyes and to look around at creation around you. Psalm 19, verse 1 says, the heavens Declare the glory of God. How many of you got to see that solar eclipse? You got the cool glasses got out there. That was this week, right? It, it, was, it, was, it was the week before. I, this is just where my mind's at, right? But as you look at it, it was amazing, amazing to see that taking place. And I don't know if you can watch a solar eclipse and say, wow, what an amazing, beautiful accident that was. The words of, 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 of the scripture speak of a God who created all things. Romans chapter 1, the Apostle Paul wrote, his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made so that men are without excuse. Mankind is really without an excuse when we look at the order and we look at design in our universe. All you have to do is look at design in nature, and it's very clear that there is a great designer. And yet children will sit in classrooms in public schools all over America with teachers who do a pretty good job of making them believe that their physical body, as complex as it is, has no designer. There's no designer. They're simply the result of random accidents over millions and millions of years. Essentially, they say, we are here because of the forces of natural selection. But if you take that same student out to the parking lot and you try to convince them that the Mercedes that's parked out there just appeared or it just developed over millions of years, that student would probably say, that's, that's ridiculous. There is obviously a, a designer behind that. Now, the psalmist declares this, I will praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. He's looking at his physical body. He's looking at the way that it all works. There's respiration, there's per perspiration, digestion, reproduction. He sees how when the body gets a cut, it actually heals itself. And so the psalmist looks and he says, man, this is, this is amazing. And yet many have been convinced that they weren't made with design. There was no designer. Again, you just came about by random chance. But modern science is debunking evolution every single day. The more we learn about things like microbiology, the more that we find that the inner workings of our cells are actually mechanisms that process information. Back in 1859, Darwin thought that the cell was a very simple structure, but today we understand so much more about the complexity of a cell, a human cell, and it is simply amazing. The cell is the most complex, it's the most elegantly designed system ever witnessed. Professor of biology, Michael Denton, in his book entitled Evolution, 
A Theory in Crisis, great book, he, he explains this complexity with an example. He says this, to grasp the reality of life as it has been revealed by molecular biology, we must magnify a cell a thousand million times until it is 20 kilometers in diameter and re- resembles a giant airship large enough to cover a great city like London or New York. What we would then see would be an object of unparalleled complexity and adaptive design. On the surface of the cell, we see millions of openings like portholes of a vast spaceship opening and closing to allow a continual stream of materials to flow in and out. And if we were to enter one of those openings, we would find ourselves in a world of supreme technology and bewildering complexity. He says this, it is a complexity beyond our own creative capabilities. He says it's a reality which is the very antithesis of chance, which excels in every sense anything produced by the intelligence of man. Think about that. He's saying there's so much complexity in the human cell that we couldn't even create that. We couldn't even design that, but you're gonna tell me it came about by chance. Now, one of the things that microbiology has discovered is that if one piece or one of the elements that make up a human cell is missing, that cell could not function at all. Now, evolution needs you to believe that these cells formed over millions of years, but microbiology is telling us that these cells could not survive without everything in place. It's what's known as irreducible complexity. In other words, it is impossible to reduce the complexity or to simplify an irreducibly complex system. These cells could not exist. They could not survive in a less complex state than they are right now. Now, There's discoveries that are happening all the time that are debunking evolution, but you will hear nothing of these studies in the public schools. Now, maybe some of these students need to bring some resources to your teacher's attention. One of those great resources for me is Answers in Genesis. It has amazing articles online, Answers in Genesis. But if the secular scientists of our time were honest, they would have to say that as they look at the world around us, as they study the world around us, it it, it seems like it's been designed, and yet they have to keep reminding themselves, there's no designer, there's no designer, there's no designer, right? Isn't that what Paul wrote in Romans chapter 1, verse 18? He says, by their unrighteousness, they what? They suppress the truth. Again, what can be known about God is, is very plain to see. Last week we looked at verses one through five and we learned that God created the earth and when he first created it it was formless, it was empty and there was darkness over the surface of the deep and yet the spirit of God was hovering over the water and then God created light. Remember the Hebrew word used here for create is the word bara, okay? It means to create something out of nothing. Listen, the evolutionist has no explanation for where original matter came from but we do. We believe that it was created out of nothing. Now, that word bara, just to remind you, it's only associated with God. You and I cannot bara. When we create something, we need raw materials to work with, right? But God can make something out of nothing. And so on day one of creation, he creates light. I said it last week that God is spirit, and therefore he does not need light in order to see. God is not making what he needs. He's making what we need. And so after space and matter come light. In our text today, we're going to look at the next five days of creation, but really, There's this amazing symmetry. If you study just Genesis chapter 1, there's this amazing symmetry in the first chapter of Genesis that I want you to see. And what you'll really see is that the first three days of creation are dedicated to forming what is formless, and the next three days are dedicated to filling that void. And what's so amazing is that the literary form that you see in Genesis chapter 1 is the same symmetry that we see in creation. Now, That that should not be surprising to us because God designed creation and he also gave us his word, right? But but I want you to see this before we jump into the text. On day one, space is created. On day four, that space is filled with the sun, moon, and stars. On day two, the seas are created. Day five, they're filled with birds and fish. On day three, land will appear. On day six, that land will be filled with creatures. There is this pattern throughout Genesis of things being formed and then being filled. The space is formed and then the void is filled. I believe God works the same way in our lives, right? When we come to him by grace, when we do that, he takes the the formless void of our hearts and he begins to shape them. He gives us, first of all, a desire, right, to know him, and then he fills us with his spirit. So in the same way we see it in creation, really our lives as people of faith are formed by God and then filled by the creator. 
But there's this amazing order, there's this amazing numerical harmony in the seven days of creation. Seven, of course, is a number of completion for the Hebrews. There, now, there are three nouns in the first sentence. You look at the, the passage here, verse one. Can you see them? What are the three nouns in the first verse? Shout them out. Come on, nouns, person, place, thing. What do you see? God, heavens, and earth. Okay, God, heavens, and earth. Each of those words are repeated in multiples of seven. So the word Elohim occurs 35 times, seven times five. Heaven occurs 21 times, seven times three. Earth, 21 times, seven times three, right? There is this amazing literary perfection to Genesis chapter one, but we need to understand this. It's not just good literature, okay? Day one of creation, God created light, and he saw that it was good. This is the first of six occasions in chapter one that that God saw what he created and it was good. And, And now the repetition there, it, it lets us know that the Torah thinks this is important, okay? It also lets us know that the world that God created was good. It lets us know that creation and order are good. There is this uh, inherent pleasure of God over that which he created. And, and if the Bible says that the world is good, then those of us who believe in the Bible have reason for optimism, amen? Like even when life gets difficult, there should be optimism that this world is, is good and good will eventually prevail, but God takes pleasure as he looks at his handiwork. Now, a couple of things I want to make clear as we jump into the text. This is not recreation, as some will tell you. Some theorize that there was this great period of, of time between verse 1 and verse 2 of Genesis chapter 1, that God had an initial creation where he made the dinosaurs and some other creatures. That was a time that Satan was cast down to earth during this time. Earth became chaos, and then it became darkness that we see in verse 2, but I I don't believe that to be true. For one thing, Scripture doesn't say anything about that, okay? But the other thing I want to make clear is that in regards to the word day, the Hebrew word used here, write it down, is the word nom, okay? N-O-M. And and it can have a number of meanings in in the original Hebrew. It it can mean a 24-hour period. When we talk about a day, that's usually what we think about, right? A a 24-hour period. But it could also refer to the time uh, between dusk and dawn. We'll say it. It was... It was hot out during the day, but it cooled off at at night, right? And so we're referring to that time when the sun was out. But it can also refer to an era of time. When Scripture says the day of the Lord, it is a period of time. It's not a specific day. Just like when we say, you know, back in my day, right? We're not referring to a specific day. We're referring to an era of time. So how should this word be interpreted here in Genesis chapter 1? I I think it's very important, okay? Okay. Uh, I said I wasn't going to get into the old earth, young earth stuff last week. Well, I changed my mind. This week we're going to get into it a little bit, okay? Because if we look at the context in which the word is used here, describing each day there is evening and there is morning, it suggests that the author of Genesis, I believe, meant a 24-hour period, okay? Each day of creation is a 24-hour period. That was the standard interpretation of, of the days of Genesis, understand, for most of Christian history. However, in the 1800s, there was this paradigm shift that began with the scientific community, and and really that shift was driven by a hostility towards religion. And so the motivation was to interpret things in ways that are contrary to the Bible, and this caused a rift within the scientific community. But when I look at passages like Exodus chapter 20, Exodus chapter 20 gives us the Ten Commandments, right? Verses 8 through 11, when you look at the Ten Commandments, we see that God himself used the six days of creation as a model for our work week, okay? Verse eight, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall, do, you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or your sojourner who is within your gates. For, within, for in six days the Lord made the heavens, the earth, and the sea and all that is in them, and he rested on the seventh. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day, and he made it holy. Apparently, God had us in mind even before he made us on the sixth day. He wanted to provide an example for us. And if the days of creation, hear me, they're not literal days, then the, the fourth commandment does not make any sense. And so it's my view that the six days of creation are six literal days, or the seven days he rested, right? And so when God spoke the divine command, let there be light, the text literally says, light be, light was. That's what it said, light be and light was. Creation was immediate. 
It, it didn't take millions of years for the universe to come into existence. Now, you might ask, well, why does that even matter, okay? It matters because as soon as you move away from a little, literal interpretation of the beginning of Genesis, then the truths of Scripture begin to suffer. Genesis chapter 1 is not a science book that tells us how it all came to be, okay? There's no inner workings of like the, the DNA and, and the molecules, right, of how God created the plants and the animals. And, and part of the reason for that is that God is a supernatural God. Supernatural means he transcends the natural. But because we live in a natural world and, and we understand natural processes, that's the way we tend to look at Scripture. But Scripture lets us know that every so often God does supernatural things. It means he transcends the natural order. But if you're not comfortable with the supernatural, then you will tend to struggle with the literal interpretation of creation. Some are, are trying to make creation and evolution fit together, and so what they'll do is they'll say, well, when God says the first day, that's not really a day, that's millions of years, okay? And they'll bend over backwards trying to get you to believe that a day doesn't really mean a day. Now, another reason that they do this is they've been convinced by secular scientists that the universe has existed for millions and billions of years. Go back millions and billions of years. They'll say, all the way back then when the dinosaurs roamed the earth. They'll, they'll claim that the dinosaurs existed before mankind was created. Have you ever heard that before? I don't think that was the case, okay? I, I believe Adam lived in a Jurassic world, okay? I, I think he and Eve had the, the first tickets to Jurassic Park, okay? Dinosaurs did not come millions of years before the first human. Now, I take issue with that view that dinosaurs existed before and they died off before God created man, right? That they existed somewhere in millions of years before man was made. Now, what's the issue with that? The issue for me is death. In order to believe that the dinosaurs existed and died off before man, I would have to believe that death was in the world before sin. But that's not what Scripture tells us. The Bible makes it very clear, we're going to see it in Genesis chapter 3, that death enters the world when sin enters the world, right? When, when Adam and Eve sinned, it was at that point that death was introduced into the creation, meaning it would have been impossible for dinosaurs to have existed and died off before mankind. Are you tracking with me? Right? And so if you hold the view that the days of Genesis are, are millions of years and you believe that the dinosaurs were around long before man was created but they died off, then you have to believe that death was around before man. And that means that God factored death into his creation. See, I don't believe that to be the case. Because at the end of every 24-hour period, God looks at creation. What does he say? He says, it is, it's good. I can't fathom God looking at death and destruction and decay and saying, well, that's good, right? The Bible teaches us God does not declare death as good. He declares death is the, the enemy, right? In fact, it's the last enemy to be destroyed. And so we run into a lot of problems when we try to take the Bible and marry it with evolutionary science. There are some Christians who go so far as to say, well, the first 11 chapters of Genesis are symbolic, okay? They don't take them literally at all until you come to the story of Abraham, right? They, they won't take it literally, okay? They'll, they'll say Abraham is when true historical events begin, but before that, it's a lot of metaphor. It's a lot of symbolism. It's a lot of figures of speech. But the moment you do that, hear me, you create a lot of problems. Like if the first 11 chapters of Genesis are, are just symbolic, what do you do with the statements made by the Apostle Paul that talk about how death came into the world by one man and life through another, right? Paul is very clear about the origin of death, and so if you try to marry creation with the evolutionary process, there's going to be a lot of places where you say, well, that doesn't fit my theology. And, and as soon as you begin to kind of cut and paste scripture and take the parts you, you like and say, well, that part, that can't be literal, right? Then you've created the Bible in the image you want it to be rather than taking the word of God and saying, you know what? This is the authority, okay? This is the authority, and this is going to shape my understanding, not my, my view of evolution, okay? Verse 6. And God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse, and it was so. And God called the expanse heaven. And there was evening, and there was morning the second day. Let there be an expanse. The Hebrew word there is the word rakia. It's only found here in Scripture. Maybe your Bible translates it as firmament, right? It is a, a space. And the waters of the land are, are separated from the waters of the sky. And so you have this, 
great uh, ball, the earth, yes, it is a ball, don't say for a minute, flat earth nonsense, please. It is a ball, okay, covered in water, right? Now, now here's something scientists believe that the Bible speaks to, and that's the existence of a significant water vapor in the sky. That at creation, there was this vapor blanket that would have changed the ecology of the whole earth, a, a thick vapor blanket that would have acted almost like a, a greenhouse. It would have regulated the temperature on earth so there would be uh, no extremes in temperature. The entire earth had perfect weather, kind of like San Diego weather, right? I would love San Diego if it weren't for the traffic and the overpopulation and, well, the fact that it's in California. No offense to my California friends, but they know what I mean, okay? But picture this. The, the world would have no great temperature variations. There would be no strong winds. There would not even be rain as we know it, but yet everything would be lush and tropical, right? It was all fed by evaporation and condensation, heavy dew on the ground in the morning. And that vapor blanket would filter out a lot of the Earth's UV rays. The, the things that we know today cause many mutations, things that decrease human lifespan, meaning lifespan would have been significantly longer. Now, that lines up with what we understand from Scripture. When we talk about a worldwide flood, scientists say, well, there's no way there would, could, it could rain for 40 days and 40 nights unless you had a vapor barrier that provided a reservoir for a potential world flood, and God came along and he said, you know what, let it rip. After the flood, we know that people no longer live close to a 1,000 years. Lifespan began to decrease significantly. Now, on the second day of creation, God's separating the waters below from the waters above, and it's this separation, it's this distinction that actually makes life on earth possible. Again, these distinctions in Genesis 1 are so important because they become the building blocks of life. Verse 9 there's, there's a lot that's going to happen, okay, on, on the third day. Track with me. And God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together in one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth and the waters that were gathered together he called seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed and fruit trees bearing fruit in which is their seed each according to its kind. That's an important word. It's kind on the earth. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their own kinds, and trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening, and there was morning the third day. As we already said, the earth was originally covered with water, but now the waters are gathered into one place, and, and dry land begins to appear. And so God designates the land, and then he begins to fill the land with vegetation. But all of this is happening. Remember, this is all happening before the creation of the sun, okay? Meaning the plants that are, are, are there, they're getting sufficient nourishment from the light that God created before the sun and the moon. Verse 14, and God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. And let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years. And let them be lights in the expanse of heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. And God set them in the expanse of the heaven to give light to the earth, to rule over the day and over the night and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good and there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. God puts light in the sky. He makes the sun and the moon, and these lights are to be signs uh, for seasons, right? Since the beginning of man, time, man has used the sun. We've used the, the stars to measure and, and to mark time and direction. So he creates two great lights. You, you, you looked at both of them, right, when you, when you looked at that eclipse, right? They are the sun and they're the moon. Now, what a, what a statement to help God's people understand that the sun and the moon are, are created, they're not deities. Again, the sun and moon were worshipped throughout the ancient world, especially in Egypt, right? But they're not mentioned here by name. The, the sun and moon are not gods. If they are created by God, he sets them in the expanse of the heavens to give light to the earth. Here's what we know from science today, that the position of the sun in relation to the earth is perfect, <laughs> 93 million miles away. If it were any closer, we would all burn up. If it were any farther away, we would all freeze to death. The position of the sun in relation to the earth is perfect, and scripture tells us why. It's because God set it there. 
He placed the sun exactly where he knew it needed to be for life to thrive on earth. That's what the Bible says. But what does the Big Bang Theory say? Well, we just got lucky. Like, we got really, really lucky, guys. Flat out dumb luck, right? No, no, no. The Bible says that God set it in its place. Oh, yeah, and the stars. Let's not forget about the stars. Today, the the Hubble telescope records images of expanses that we can't even fathom with billions and billions of stars. Some of these stars, they're they're so big, they make our own sun look insignificant. But think about it. God creates all these stars and and black holes and countless planets, galaxy after galaxy after galaxy. And Moses is just like, oh, yeah, and the stars, right? Uh, Again, God looks, and he looks at the position of the the moon and, and the sun. He looks at the perfect tilt of our planet. He looks at the orbit of the earth around the sun that gives us 365, 24-hour periods. He looks at the stars and he says, you know what, that's perfect. That is good. Day five in verse 20, and God said, let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth according, across the expanse of the heavens. And so God created the great sea creatures and every living creature that moves with which the waters swarm according to their kind, and every winged bird according to its kind, and God saw that it was good, and God blessed them, saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters and the seas. Everyone who loves to fish is like, come on, praise God, right? Fill the waters and the seas. Let the birds multiply on the earth, and there was evening, and there was morning the fifth day. I don't know if you caught it, but scripture just answered that age-old question. I know it's the one you've been wrestling with all your life. You're like, man, I, I'm hoping, pastor, that I can find the, the answer here in Genesis to this question, and it's this, right? Which came first, the chicken or the egg? I think it's pretty clear, right? Because we know chickens are birds, right? That, that God created the chicken, not the egg. He created the chicken with the ability to lay the egg, just like he created trees and vegetation. He created mature trees that had the ability to create seed and to propagate. God does the same thing in the animal kingdom. And there's a word we see in regards to the creation of vegetation. It's that word kind. Did you see it? In the Hebrew, it's the word min, okay? And so God creates plants of every kind, trees of every kind. He creates fish according to their kind, winged birds according to their kind. All of plant life and animal life is created according to its kind. And he also creates this barrier in these kinds. And so we have that in the animal kingdom, this kind and and that kind. But one kind cannot become another kind. What that means is you can't breed a dog and a cat and get a dat, right? I don't know why you would do that to a dog in the first place. But thank God you can't do that, right? Every family of living creatures reproduces after its kind. You'll never get a cat that mutates into a dog. You'll you'll never get a chicken that turns into a snake, right? You can give it all the time you want. You can wave the, the magic wand of millions of years, but every species will reproduce or produce according to its kind because that's the way that God designed it. God made it that way, and that's the way it functions best. Now, Within a kind, you can make certain hybrids. I don't know if you know this, but a boysenberry is a hybrid of a few different berries that they put together, and they came up with a boysenberry. I, I'm not so excited about a boysenberry, but you, know, you can do that, right? You can make hybrids within the animal kingdom according to their kind. You can breed a lion and a tiger, and you can get a liger. Yes, it's a real thing, all right? Napoleon Dynamite fans, it is a real thing, okay? And, and so you can make hybrids, but generally the hybrid is sterile, And the mutation is always inferior. But evolutionary science wants you to believe that this kind can become that kind if you just give it millions of years. The problem is they can't prove it. Very often evolutionists will point to examples of microevolution, right? And microevolution is simply variations of a kind within its kind. Okay, there are transitional changes within a species which can happen because that species itself is adapting to its environment. But science is now discovering that transitions within a species come from existing genes, not even mutation. In other words, God had it all figured out in the beginning, and you cannot improve on what he did. There are certain kinds of finches. This was one of the things that that, uh, Darwin tried to draw attention to. But there are certain kinds of finches that over the years, their beaks will become longer or shorter as they adapt to their environment. And so the evolutionists will say, look, see, there's your proof of evolution. But again, this is microevolution because there's never a change of species. If the finch has a longer beak, it is still a finch, right? It does not become a lizard. Again, that's microevolution because it's an adaptation of species within their species. 
but there's macroevolution, which the evolutionist is trying to convince you really does happen, or, or at least it did happen. The only problem is the fossil record doesn't show it at all. That's what's known as transmutation, change from one species to another, another species. And we have not unco- uncovered any fossil records that show one species changing to another species. And I'm going to predict this. We're never going to find it. They're not going to find it, and the reason is because when God created the different species of animals on the planet, he said, let them be each according to their kind. That's where they are, and that's where they'll always stay. Philip Johnson was a UC Berkeley law professor. He was an opponent of evolutionary science. He wrote this, if evolution means the gradual change of one kind of organism into another kind, the outstanding characteristic of the fossil record is is the absence of evidence for evolution. Evolutionist Niall Eldridge wrote, we paleontologists have said that the history of life in the fossil record supports the story of gradual evolution, all the while knowing that it does not. Again, Darwin himself admitted that the state of the fossil record was the most obvious and gravest objection which can be argued against his theory. Verse 24, and God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds. There's that word again. Livestock and creeping things and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds and the livestock according to their kinds and everything that creeps on the ground according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Again, each is made according to its kind and God saw that it was good. And then verse 26, we come to the height of God's creation. Then God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. Now note the phrase, in our image and after our likeness. This is the height of God's creation because he does not say these things about anything else he creates. Nothing else in creation is prefaced in scripture by the saying, in his likeness. When you move past the question of man, how was I created? Then you come to this question of, well, who am I? Who am I? Understand, this is our starting point. The fact that you and I as human beings are created in the image of God means that we are purposeful in creation. You're not some random accident. You're not some great mistake of the universe. No, God created you. Hear me this morning. He created you with design and he created you with purpose. And that's why we as the people of God believe that all life is sacred. All human life is made in the image of God. It's why we stand for life. That's why we stand for life from the womb to the tomb because it is sacred. It's made in the image of God, amen? It's why we strongly oppose things like abortion on demand, oppose things like assisted suicide, because we believe that humans are made in the image of God, and that makes them special. That sets them apart from all the rest of creation. If what the evolutionist says is true, then you're just like one of the other mammals on the face of the earth. Like The only thing that makes you different is, is you, you wear clothes and you drive a car, right? But come on, when, when you look at things seriously, You know this, mankind has capabilities and capacities far beyond anything else in the animal kingdom. Let us make man in our image and our likeness. But know this, that the God who made it all, he made you and he made me. See, so often, I think we run from that fact because it forces us to recognize that we are not our own. I mean, why else would would men prefer to believe that there is no God? Why else would they go through all this mental gymnastics to explain the order and the complexity that we see around us? Here's why. If we believe that that our world is one big accident, then we are indebted to no one and we are free to do whatever we desire to do. But if we see that we are part of God's creation, then we learn that we're called to glorify God with his creation. So I want to ask you as we close today, what role have you decided to play in God's creation? Do you live your life, and I know this is a big, bold term, but do you live your life to the glory of God? See, I think when you understand who you are and who God's created you to be, then you say, well, that's my only fitting response, to live my life to the glory of God. Or do you live like you're free to simply gratify whatever desire you have? I want to encourage you this morning. Put your life in the hands of God. Allow him to bring order out of any chaos you may see right now. Allow him to bring fullness where it feels like there's emptiness or it feels like there's a void. Listen, if he can bring order and fullness to the universe, he can simply bring order and fullness to the chaos and the emptiness that you may find in your life right now. 
And I believe this, that you can call on God. Again, he's the great creator. He's the one who created the heavens and the earth. And, and you can ask him, even as the psalmist did, to create in you a, a clean heart, create in you a new heart. Because here's what I believe, that the one who formed the earth, the one who, who filled the earth, he's ready to form you. He's, he's ready to fill your life. He's simply waiting for you to come to him. Would you stand with me this morning? As a part of God's creation, and we're going to get into those verses next week. Don't have time today. But as the, the, the height of God's creation, as one created in the image of God, you have the opportunity this week to glorify him in the way that you live your life. Think about that. You're created with a great design. You're created with a great purpose. This week you have the opportunity to fulfill that purpose. And so, Lord God, we thank you this morning. And we thank you this morning for your word. We thank you that it is foundational to our lives. And Lord, I, I do pray that as a church, as we continue to walk through this, Lord God, that, that you would teach us, Lord, by your word, your plan and your purpose. Lord, we believe today that you exist. We believe, Lord, that everything that we see around us was created by your hand. And so as we continue to learn and grow together as a church, I pray, Lord, that our, our response would be that you do deserve the glory. You do deserve the honor. Lord, for all that you've done in our lives, for, for your goodness and for your faithfulness, Lord God, we, we thank you this morning. I want to encourage you, just, just where you are right now, even just, just out, stretch your hands, stretch out your hands this morning. It's just a sign of surrender. Maybe you're here today and you've been going your own way, doing this your own way. I encourage you even right now just to submit to your creator. Say, God, I, I believe this morning that you created me with purpose and you created me with design. Even right now, allow the Holy Spirit to, to begin to, to speak to you. Allow him to begin to renew your mind. You can even in this moment cast off the lies of the enemy and receive from him his purpose, his design for your life. So take a moment, even before we sing, just to reflect. Say, God, fill me. Fill my life with that purpose. Fill my life with that, that great design. Lord God, I want to glorify you in, in everything that I do and everything that I say.
declaration. So I'll stand with arms high and heart abandoned in awe of the one who gave it all. So I'll stand, my soul, Lord, to you surrender all. I am is yours. response to a God who has given us life is to give him back that life and say, God, use me. God, fulfill your purpose through me. I pray that's the case for your life this week. Let him be glorified in and through you in everything you do and everything you say. May your life give him glory. Amen. God bless you as you go today. Don't rush out of here. I do want to encourage you to come back Tuesday night. We're going to continue our series, What's the Difference? I'm going to be teaching this week on the difference between Christianity and Hinduism. And so I invite you to come back to learn, to worship, and to pray together. God bless you as you go, church. Go in the grace and mercy of our Lord.